So, as black men, there isn't truly space for us to talk about the things that, that we're going through. And uh, this body of work started as me wanting to highlight the insecurities that black men carry. So, um, you know, conversations about body image issues and um, other, other things in that, that, that spectrum that we never speak about as, as black men and there's no space for that. So um, as I was working through the, the works, I realized that it's not like everyone experiences insecurities. Everyone has things that they're insecure about, whether, no matter what your demographic is or what part of uh, a culture you're part of. And so I realized it wasn't about insecurities. The work was actually about the unspoken burden that black men carry. So um, yes, you have those insecurities and those 100% human things that you deal with. Um, but there's on top of that, there's the additional burdens of, you know, financial burdens and, and the things that your, your spouse is going through. You don't want to be a, a contributing factor to their stress. So then you start holding on to things and not talking about things that you're truly going through, whether it's, um, you know, low self-esteem issues or, or like I said, whatever it is that you're going through at that moment, um, you don't want to burden your significant other with that. So even the person you're the most vulnerable with, you still can't be truly 100% vulnerable because you don't want to add to, like, your your goal uh, a lot of times is to be that security for your significant other. And whether that's physical security, whether that's mental security, whatever it is, financial security, you, your goal is to be the security for them. And you know, speaking to them about, you know, things that you're going through might add a burden to them or add stress to them and make them feel um, insecure uh, and things that, you know, oh, now I'm stressed about this other thing that you're like, well, I wasn't really that stressed about it, but it's just something that I was thinking about as well. So um, a lot of times we swallow those, those and just deal with them on some, all right, I'll handle it. It'll get done. And I think, you know, our fathers were the same way, our grandfathers, like other men in our lives, whether, you know, you had an actual father figure, that's just the thing that's always been instilled in us as black men is, yeah, you're dealing with, you know, government sanctioned police brutality, basically. You're dealing with, you know, existing in the world, in a world that, in the country especially, that loves what you can provide um, in terms of your, your gross domestic product, basically, as a black man. Like, they love the product and they love the culture of blackness, uh, but they don't really love us. <clears throat> they don't really love black men. And so, um, knowing that and then having to still move out in the world and exist in the world, I wanted these works to have that sentiment and have that feeling of all of those things, all those things that combine and come together to make you feel like, yes, I have to put on the face that I'm okay, I'm good, I'm handling this, uh, no matter whether you actually are or not. I went to an art high school here in Dallas, Booker T. Washington. Um, and in that, like when I was in school, we were told, it was long, 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 long ago. Uh, we were told that, you know, graphic design was the only viable way to make money as a, as a artist and as a creative. Uh, obviously we know that's not the case now, and especially with the advent of, you know, social media and the internet, the, the way it's taken, taken hold of culture as, as in general, um, we realized that's not the case. But back then, being a graphic designer was the only way that a lot of people saw creatives and artists being able to make a living. And so um, I have a graphic design background, and so anytime I come up with a concept, whatever it may be, I try to figure out how to distill it into its most basic terms. I don't want it to be something that I try to be really good. Obviously, there's no way that I'll be able to know every single way that somebody is going to read something or, or take something, uh, but I try my best to make sure I try to think through those ideas as much as possible. So if I'm coming up with a sketch, I'll lay it out, look at it and say, okay, how is this going to be perceived by the viewer? And if there's conflicting messaging, if there's things that um, you know, it's pulling too much or it's drawing your attention over here or anything like that, then I'll, you know, rehash it and re figure out how do I get it to, this is exactly the sentiment I'm trying to, to portray. Now, again, whether somebody actually receives it that way or not, 
is not up to me at that point anymore. It's completely however it's, it's received after that. But I try my best to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. So whenever I'm doing a painting I, or a sketch or a drawing or whatever, I'm working through that process and trying to figure out like, how do I distill this even more? So if you're a graphic designer and you know, you're, you look at uh, any sports logo or any logo, um, the best logos are the simplest. So if you look at the Nike swoosh, if you look at McDonald's arches, if you look at any of these, like there's not a lot of line work. There's not a lot of information there but it's some of the most iconic, like the iconic and the iconography that they've created is because of how simple it is and it's unmistakable, no matter if you're looking at it at, you know, pinhead size or if you're looking at it on a billboard, you can identify that logo immediately. And so that's what a lot of the times when I'm working on the works, I want that same thing. So I'll, this is what the process, or this is what the thought is. This is what the concept is. How do I do that in the, simplest, most digestible way possible. Um, I don't think it matters to me uh, in terms of how it fits into the, the world stage and what's going on uh, communally in the art world right now. I think um, I've tried my entire career to do things that are relevant and things that will be received in the, 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 the wider spectrum of the art world. And I've had a certain level of success doing that. Um, but I think with this body of work specifically, I wanted it to be something that was more personal to my own journey and things that I um, was going through in the last you know, 12 months of, of you know, working on things, either leading up to the, the works and through the process of creating the works. Um, and I think doing that actually helped quite a bit more than trying to pay attention to what's happening in the art world and trying to fit into that space because now I'm making work that is more personal to me and not things that I feel like, yeah, I'm still, the works prior to this were still things that were personal to me, but they were more personal to me while also trying to fit into that, that grand stage. Uh, whereas this stuff, I was like, I don't care where it fits. I don't care. I know that this is a conversation that other people like me need and other people that, like I said, like other black men that feel unheard and feel like no one understands what they're going through and no one is actively listening to what they're trying to say, whether they say it out loud or not. I want to be the voice for that because, like I said, just in the last, um, I mean, earlier this year, I finally realized, like, uh, with everything else that was going on in the world, like, from last year, from the election cycle to the George Floyd murder to um, just COVID being locked up in the house, all of those things are things that compound everything else you're going through in your everyday life. So just because these things are happening doesn't mean that your everyday struggles are going to go away. Like you're, you're having those on top of uh, the things that you're dealing with. And so um, last year I wasn't, I was probably the quote unquote least productive of my entire career in terms of cranking out work because I just didn't have the mental capacity to also be doing that, dealing with everything else. And then on top of that, being at the house, not going anywhere, not seeing people gaining weight, like, I've always been overweight, like, always. Like, I mean, we're Americans, all of us are overweight. But I've always been overweight to an extent that I was not necessarily comfortable with, but it had become something that I was like, this is just, it is what it is. Um, but even gained even more during COVID, where it was, like, to the point where, you know, I started, uh, like, other social media channels and other things where I'm having to film myself, and I hated the way I looked on camera. I hated the way I was photographing. I hated doing any of that process, but I know as an artist, I had to do those things in order to, you know, stay in front of people and stay relevant. And so um, that added to the, like, I've never been a person to have low self-esteem or low, like things that, like I said, like body image issues. And so dealing with that and saying, okay, I'm fortunate that the thing that I'm insecure about, I can do something about. There's a lot of other people out here that are insecure about things and, and have burdens that they can't lift, they can't get rid of, they can't remove. Um, and so I was like, well, like I said, I'm fortunate enough that I can lose weight, so I'm going to start that process and start doing that. And once I started doing that, then I realized 
Like, I mean, I lost 55 pounds since March of this year. And losing that much weight in that amount of time, you realize like how much of it was like of, in terms of how I was moving through the world was affecting like that, holding on to that much weight, like figuratively and physically um, was causing me to move through the world differently than I normally would. Um, and so with the works, I wanted to be that voice because I was like, there's no one that I could have talked to before that. I mean, I'm sure there's people I could have talked to, but there's no one I felt comfortable enough talking to about that while it was happening. And so I was like, I want to be that voice for other people that are dealing with that similar thing, whether it's weight loss, whether it's whatever it is, the grief of a lo you know losing a loved one or whatever. I want to be that voice and give them uh, like that outlet when they see the work that they can, you know, have that cathartic feeling of, okay, somebody else out there gets it. And so, like I said, I didn't really care if it fit into what everybody else was doing or how it even like fits like thematically through, through the rest of the contemporary art world right now. I just wanted to be something that I could, I could progress and move through. Cause like you said, like it is something that I'm just scratching the surface of. This is the first 16 pieces or however many pieces there ended up being of that journey. I want to continue that and see where it goes now that you know I've lost the weight and still losing more weight like how does the work change based on now that you know that about yourself now that you can admit that now that you can say that out loud now where does the work go uh, because now you've you've voiced it now what do you do with it like I said I, I think with the work it, it's a as much as I created the work in, in anticipation and hopes that people would see it and receive it, it was more of a catharsis for myself to be able to create the work and work through those thoughts of my, my own. And like I said, it just was a, a byproduct of, I'm going to make these works because painting is when I'm truly like zenned out, like this is my moment, this is what I do. Um, and so as much as frustration, I mean, as any artist knows, like as much as it's frustrating and it's, agonizing at times it's also the thing that gives me the most peace and so I wanted to work through that thought process because a lot of these works were created as I was losing the weight and so it was the the process of dealing with that like I said giving you giving a voice to that thing that you're insecure about but also making it visible for other people to see it as well and so as far as like what I'm uncovering I'm still learning that like it's it's helped to create the first however many pieces, but I don't, that's why I didn't title the pieces uh, because I want this to be an ongoing thing. And so they're literally just numbered whichever order they came in. So, um, and that's what I plan to do with the, the series because with it being an unspoken burden, I didn't want to give a, this is grief, this is, like, I didn't want people to have a preconceived notion of what each painting or each piece represents. I wanted to just be, this too is unspoken. So there's just, it's basically, everything is untitled. It's just a number of, of the thing. And like, that way I can continue pushing the series. And whether it's the only thing that I do series-wise going forward, or I continue it for the you know years to come, I can still go back to, all right, I left off on number 22. This next one, whether it's 10 years, five years, 15 years, however many years from now, when it happens, this is number 23. This is the next one after that is number 24 um, type thing. And so um, that's, and like I said, I'm through that process, I'm still learning things as well, like about myself, about the way that, you know, your mental health affects how you move through the world and how, like, because a lot of times, like black people and black men especially, Again, we're not afforded that luxury of being able to talk about mental health and be able to, and now in you know, 2021, it's becoming more commonplace and more conversational that people are having these conversations. <clears throat> but prior to you know, this year and a couple of previous years, this was something that we've never heard of athletes removing themselves from you know, the Olympics or US Open or Australian Open, whatever. Um, where they're removing themselves because they're trying to protect their own mental health. They're, they're making their humanity the focal point instead of their, like I said, their, their product and things that they can provide for people, uh, whether that's entertainment or their skill set or whatever. And so 
I think it, it's a, a conversation that will be ongoing as we learn more about ourselves just in, in general. Um, but I think it is definitely promising because it's, it's leading to a more healthy, like just existence for sure. The video installation is something that I've been in working on off and on for the last three, uh, three years or so. Um, it's not something that I've actively been working on that entire time. It's just I started the process three years ago uh, with the concept and I felt that right now was the perfect time because the space lends itself to be able to show that work. And so for, um, for that particular piece, the theme of that, is, is, the title of it is Harvest, and the theme of that is back three years ago, however long ago it was, there were a couple of fashion shows that were happening like New York Fashion Week and um, some other major fashion shows where one of the designers was walking do-rags down the, the runway and um, there was like Urban Outfitters or, or someone had like an Afro pick um, that they were selling, like something you would get at a beauty supply store for pennies on the dollar. They were selling, like trying to make it a premium price point because it's, you know, their brand. Uh, but they were changing the name of it. So it wasn't called an Afro pick. It was some other like name. Um, seeing those things, it kind of sparked the feeling of, why is it every time we do things, it's called ghetto, it's called hood, it's called like unprofessional, whatever. It's things that we are known for doing, things that are part of our culture as black Americans, even just black people in general, whether you're American or not. Like there's things that we create culturally that everyone else steals and tries to appropriate and tries to, to make their own and call it fashionable and call it trendy and call it, you know, you know, this new trend like on BuzzFeed or whoever it was there. I think that's the other thing is they were calling cornrows boxer braids and trying to like rebrand it as this other thing. And I'm like, it doesn't need to be rebranded. We already have a name for it. It already exists. We already do this. You don't need to rebrand it. Um, and I, obviously the reason they're rebranding it is to repackage it for a new audience. Uh, because if you called it a do-rag, if you called it an Afro pick, if you called it, then that's so specific to us that other people wouldn't buy it. But now you're trying to sell it to the masses and call it, again, trying to call it fashionable, trying to call it trendy, doing all this other stuff. And as I was seeing these things happen, I had the thought, like, why is it, again, you harvest black people for their culture, Worldwide, like internationally, it happens, whether it's hip hop in Asian countries, whether it's like, like I said, there's a laundry list of things that we can name of um, black American culture that has been taken. And, and I get it, like black people are cool. Like we are cool as hell. And so of course, everybody is like, yo, I want a piece of that because that's cool. And so I wanted that video installation to be things that we've been called ghetto, unprofessional, for doing, but other people try to take and like the only people that are able, everyone is able to monetize blackness except for black people. And so I wanted the video to represent that of these are all the things that are taken or tried to be taken from black people and rebranded, but things that we're just like, no, we, this is us. This is what we do. This is what, like we've built this. Don't try to take it and make it something else when it's nothing for you to just credit us for doing it because we all know where it came from in the first place. Obviously the people you're trying to promote it and pitch it to might not know, but this is a learning experience for everybody where you can teach them. Those are called cornrows. Those are not called boxer braids. Those are called do-rags, not head scarf or, like I said, there's just all these things where, I mean, every year there's hundreds of examples of you see things come out where it's a, uh, we're gonna rebrand this silk sleeping scarf or whatever. It's like, bro, it's a bonnet. Black women have been wearing this forever. Like, don't try to, like I said, it already has a name. You don't need to try to rebrand it. And so that's what that that piece was. And so with this installation, I wanted, or this like body of work, I wanted to show that piece um, in the space because I knew that it would resonate with the rest of the works. And so. Part of the reason why I've been holding on to it for three years is because I wanted the exact right opportunity to show it and not, 
just post it on my Instagram or post it on YouTube. Like I, I wanted it to have, cause I feel like it's such a big thought and it's such a, a thing that is important, whether it's an actual quote unquote big thought or not. Like, I feel like it's important enough that I didn't need to just throw it on Instagram and let it, you know, get posted. People see it in a week and then it goes away um, and gets buried by everything else that's posted. I wanted it to have like some weight to it because of the the subject matter. So when I knew I was doing the show here, I was like, oh, I know exactly. I'm bringing, I'm dusting that thing off, cleaning it up a little bit and, and making sure I can, I can show it in that space. So it was always, as soon as I knew this show was happening, I knew that piece was going in that, you know, that back gallery because I knew it would be perfect in that space. I appreciate y'all for having me. Like, this was super, like, important for me to do it here just because I grew up in South Dallas. Like, my dad went to school with Arthelo Beck. So, like, that full, like, that full circle moment of just, like, generational things, I was like, yeah, and I was just a guarantee, like, we have to do this. Um, so, yeah, I definitely appreciate that.